coronavirus. Facts, not fear, starts now. Good evening, I'm Mike Montecalvo, and thank you very much for joining us. We're joining you from Providence, Rhode Island. We begin tonight with the latest on a $2 trillion stimulus package, which President Donald Trump signed today after the House passed it earlier this afternoon. This says the number of confirmed cases of the coronavirus here in the U.S. has topped 100,000. The president also signed an order forcing GM to make ventilators under the Defense Production Act. Well, the House did approve the relief package. It didn't come without some drama. A single member of Congress Congress forced hundreds of other lawmakers to fly back to Washington at the very last minute. Washington, D.C. correspondent Alexandra Limon has more. Friday, the U.S. House passed a $2 trillion coronavirus economic relief package. But to make it possible, lawmakers were forced to return to Washington at the last minute by Congressman Thomas Massey of Kentucky. I came here to make sure our republic doesn't die by unanimous consent. Nevada Congresswoman Dina Titus was one of the lawmakers who made her way back on a nearly empty flight because she says Americans desperately need the aid. The people who work at restaurants in Chinatown, clean hotel rooms on the Strip, and entertain visitors downtown are struggling to pay rent. And Colorado Congressman Joe Naguz says the package will also send help to struggling businesses. To the small businesses in Boulder and Fort Collins and Broomfield and across our country on the brink of collapse. With a $2 trillion price tag, the economic relief package is the largest ever in U.S. history, and it received widespread support from both parties. The CARES Act gives cash payments to Americans, expands unemployment and food security benefits, provides loans to businesses, and gives billions to the healthcare industry. Given the size and the scope of this pandemic, it's a hefty price tag that must be paid. But Utah Republican Congressman John Curtis said while necessary, spending money the government doesn't have will have consequences. It's time to get our financial house in order before it becomes our next crisis. In Washington, Alexandra Limon. The U.S. Surgeon General warns the coronavirus pandemic will get even worse next week in potential hot spots such as Detroit, Chicago and New Orleans. In Louisiana, state officials admit they're facing a critical shortage of medical supplies as the confirmed death toll jumped by more than 40 percent overnight to 119. So far, more than 21,000 people have been tested statewide. The governor says the state is in a dire situation as the number of coronavirus cases continues to spike quickly, saying hospitals could run out of bed space and ventilators by early April. We are one day deeper into this event, and while we don't know what the duration will be, we do know that we are doing everything within our power to respond to this crisis, uh, and we need everyone. I implore everyone to do their part as well. Across New Orleans, life is at a standstill. Most businesses are shuttered and the usually bustling streets, as you can see, are mostly quiet. Now, despite dropping more than 915 points today, the Dow finished the week higher. The Dow rose almost 13 points, its biggest one week gain since 1938. The S&P gained more than 10 percent this week for its best weekly performance in 11 years. Down in North Carolina, the state's governor issued a statewide stay at home order. Let's go live now to CBS 17's Angela Taylor in Raleigh. Angela, what can you tell us about the order and when does it go into effect? So, right, Mike. So today, Governor Roy Cooper announced that we do have a stay-at-home order. It will take effect Monday at 5 o'clock. Only essential businesses like pharmacies and grocery stores will remain open. And here's the reason why this order was issued. Right now, we have close to 800 cases of COVID-19. 77 people are in the hospital. And tonight, we know that four people have died because of COVID-19. That includes, uh, includes a city of Raleigh worker. He, uh, His name was Adrian Grubbs, just 37 years old. Uh, we were able to talk to his co-workers today who are concerned about their own safety now. As an employee of Raleigh's Solid Waste Services. It's heartbreaking because, I mean, he was an intelligent guy. Charlene Parker works with Grubbs and says his co-workers are now worried someone else will get coronavirus or could already have it. <laughs> Who has he been around? You know, what has he touched? You, and 
that starts to become the concern now. Did he possibly infect anybody else? Or could we possibly, you know, be infected? On March 17th, the Raleigh City Workers Union sent this letter to city leaders, outlining concerns they had about their work conditions amid the pandemic. Two days later, the city sent this letter in response, saying, quote, the team is working hard to identify existing and emerging practices to respond to the needs of our community and organization. But after the news of Grubb's death, the union sent this letter asking that all solid waste employees be tested for COVID-19. There's over 150 people that work there, and only two people have been quarantined in the whole entire building. That is right now like the major concern about is there a possibility like a man or a woman right next to you, could they possibly have it? We put a call into city leaders. No one could talk on camera, but we were sent this list of the steps the city's taking to protect its employees, including staggering shifts, reducing the number of people in a truck, increasing cleaning, and checking everyone's temperature before a shift begins. That was our Colleen Quigley reporting. Now, it is important to note, I did mention that Grubbs was 37. He did have an underlying health condition. He is survived by his wife and three young children. A lot of focus right now is on our school system. As you know, Governor Roy Cooper has closed classrooms until at least May 15th. So today, Wake County school leaders addressed how they plan to push forward. Technology is a top priority. 1,000 teachers will receive laptops. Students will also get laptops, hotspots, and additional online learning material. Students should start receiving their new devices as early as next week, and we wanted to know if the district is ready in case the school year does not resume. That our governor is committed to, to hoping that, that we can salvage the school year, but it is an evolving situation. I don't know that we're fearful. Uh, we are we do anticipate it, uh, and I think that we are uh, planning for that and, and prepared if, if that is the case. And of course, you'll notice that they're um, on a video conference. They were doing that for all the media to be able to get an update on the school district. Now, as you see, the district is also providing students breakfast and lunch at 29 of its food distribution sites. Well, tonight we're getting a look at what what is happening at Fort Bragg for those soldiers that are in quarantine. Those that came from overseas are being forced into a 14 day quarantine. CBS 17's Kayla Strayer has their story. A truck full of supplies packed by the Charlotte Hornets is loaded up and ready to go from this storage area to these barracks where soldiers are under quarantine right now. Grab you a monster and grab you a, a snack pack there. Brian Knight with the USO of North Carolina hands out boxes of snacks and hygiene items to 82nd Airborne Division paratroopers just returning home from a deployment to Afghanistan. Nobody wants to come back from a nine month deployment and go right into to two weeks of quarantine, but they get it, they understand. These soldiers are just a few days away from the end of their 14 day quarantine. Drop offs like this go a long way to boosting morale. The struggle would be there, right? It would, it would be a shock. Um, but I think in these times, they understand. They get it. Brian drops off supplies every couple of days here at the barracks and at tents like this set up for soldiers in quarantine. Anytime you get a chance to support the service members and their family is, is a great day. Lots of laughs and extra workouts as they make the best of their quarantine orders. The leadership of Fort Bragg is taking care of them. Uh, amazingly. Um, so between the three quarantine zones, everyone's got a, uh, a gym in the box. We stop by uh, and drop supplies like this um, to continue to support them, keep their, uh, keep their morale up. Uh, so we're doing what we can. And that was Brian talking. He's with the USO. He's actually a former paratrooper, so he knows what it's like to come back from combat and the needs that they that those soldiers need. So this next story is really going to make you smile. Take a look. It's the best birthday I ever had in my life and probably ever will have. And I love being 70. <laughs> I never thought I'd say that. <laughs> Happy birthday to Connie Mendler. She turned 70 today, but she couldn't have her usual celebration. Instead, her best friend threw her a birthday party parade. As you can see, dozens of people came by. She was so excited. And hey, what's better than one birthday? How about two? We also had an 80-year-old man here in North Carolina celebrate his birthday with a parade as well. Mike? 
Love those type of stories. All right, thank you, Angela. Here in Rhode Island, Governor Gina Raimondo extended restrictions today as the number of coronavirus cases continue to rise. Rhode Island reported 38 new cases today, bringing the total to 203. State police have also set up checkpoints following the governor's order requiring people from New York to self-quarantine. The governor also extended a number of her executive orders restricting what can and cannot be open. WPRI 12's Ted Nisi has more on what the governor had to say today. New protocols today, even here at the State House, where anyone who must enter is now being screened with questions about their medical history before they're allowed in. Governor Gina Raimondo shouldering a binder packed with paperwork as she headed into her office Friday to continue Rhode Island's battle against coronavirus. I have spent last night reviewing all of our executive orders and all of our regulations. The ban on gatherings of 10 or more and the shutdown of dine-in restaurant service both extended to April 13th. The order for arriving travelers to self-quarantine locked in through April 25th. With New York the epicenter of the outbreak, Rhode Island State Police now stationed at the border to flag down cars with New York plates. And this weekend, the National Guard will go door to door in coastal communities to track down anyone who's arrived from there. Raimondo defends the extreme measures. I don't like those optics, but I'll tell you the optics that I like even less the optics of Rhode Island Hospital bursting at the seams, not being able to take care of all the patients that we have. All this is testing revealed 38 new cases of COVID-19 in Rhode Island, 28 people now hospitalized. There are seven who are intubated among the 11 who are in the ICU currently. That number continues to evolve. Social distancing, once again, a must this weekend. It's only natural to be saying, do we still have to do this? Can we have a dinner party tomorrow night? Can my friends come over? Can we go to the park in a big group of people? The answer is no, 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 and no. If we were to have an outbreak right now, similar to what you're seeing in New Orleans or New York City or elsewhere, we are not ready for that. We are not set up for that. The governor also announcing that families on the SNAP food stamps program will be eligible for the full maximum monthly benefit starting on April 1st. The governor also saying she expects to make a major announcement about the future of the school year in Rhode Island as students continue to learn at home. That announcement expected on Monday. At the State House, Ted Nisi, Eyewitness News. Ted, thank you. The coronavirus has hit the TSA. Today they announced more than 20 airport screeners also have the virus. That brings it up to 64 TSA workers who have tested positive. Now most of them have popped up within the last couple of weeks and nearly half of the cases are in the New York and New Jersey area. As you can imagine, there haven't been as many people flying and the TSA has already closed some checkpoints. The TSA says their agents are going to start wearing N95 masks, the same ones healthcare workers are using. Well, everyone knows that grocery stores have been inundated with customers, with people looking to stop up, stock up on things like water, sanitizer, soap, and of course, toilet paper. Aristea Brady from KDVR in Denver has the latest on the number of cases out there and tells us what one restaurant is doing with its takeout orders. Aristea? Yeah, pretty crafty over here in Colorado. Good evening to you. The number of positive COVID cases in Colorado now at more than 1,700. The number of deaths up seven today for a total of 31. The first reports of the coronavirus in Colorado triggered panic buying at our grocery and convenience stores. Probably a lot. Uh, same case for many of you. Toilet paper, sanitizers, even most foods were flying off the shelves faster than the stores could even restock. Now, weeks in, many products are back, except as you mentioned, that thing we keep talking about, toilet paper. Fox 31 problem solver Nicole Fierro dug into the issue and found some solutions. Down to the final few sheets with slim chances on stocking up with another pack of toilet paper. Here's what local grocery shelves look like before 9 a.m. Yet this is new footage of the warehouses supplying them. We don't have an issue with access to supplies. It's more of an issue with getting those products from our warehouse, which you can see is fully stocked, to our stores and on our shelves. So what's the issue with getting some tissue? We went down the list, calling local stores. Well, babe, there's nothing on the shelf. I can see it from here. By 11 a.m.? We don't. You're out? Yes. 
Online, you can pay 40 bucks for a bulk pack of 10 on Amazon that'll come in 12 to 20 days. If you find a pack that's not out of stock in Costco, deliveries are four to five days. You know, the toilet paper manufacturers, I think we're caught a little bit off guard. Chris Howes, president of Colorado Retail Council, says toilet paper manufacturers forecast production amounts based on last year's sales. And a toilet paper freak out in 2020, that wasn't something anyone produced. Predicted, but they're still delivering plenty to supply Denver. This is not like a hurricane. Uh, the roads are open and the supply chain is strong. It's the fearful folks taking more than they need that's putting local stores in a real bind. You don't need it. Leave it on the shelf for the next person. To try to help their neighbors out of this stinky situation, Chocolate Lab Denver is selling off their rolls and even delivering them to customers along with their takeout. The crazy times uh, call for creative measures. So. The owner says letting people buy up to eight rolls is helping them keep their doors open, with sales down about 78% right now. We've gone through one full case already, which is uh, 60 rolls. Um, yesterday, I probably sold another uh, 30 or 40 of them. In Denver, Nicole Fierro reporting. Nicole, thank you. And today we heard from Governor Jared Polis. He says that Colorado hospitals hope to add about a thousand beds, ICU in particular, by May, 5,000 by summer. But he says that's nowhere near what the state would need in a worst case scenario. Reporting from Denver, I'm Aristea Brady. Back to you. Aristea, thank you very much. As the battle to stop the spread of the coronavirus continues across the nation, the governor of Missouri taking another step today to help in the fight. Fox 4's John Holt is in Kansas City now with more on that decision and details on the need for more tests. Yeah, Mike, today as the number of confirmed coronavirus cases rose to 670 in Missouri, the governor activated the National Guard for potential assistance in the ongoing battle. Governor Mike Parson specifically saying today at his briefing, the National Guard is not being called into action to invoke martial law. The Guard will have much the same mission it did during last year's flooding in Missouri. The main goal is set up testing sites and transport equipment. Let me also assure you that we are not some outside organization coming in to impose someone else's agenda on you. We are here to help you, not control you. Hell, we are you. The Guard says there will probably be needs it hasn't even thought of yet, but it's ready to go if needed. Meantime, a Metro Kansas City urgent care center that's been treating patients daily with symptoms of COVID-19 can no longer test them for the virus. Our Linda Wager shows us why. This urgent treatment center in Independence was on the front lines of testing for COVID-19. The Jackson County Health Department even referred people here. Now we're down to zero. Nurse practitioner Valerie Bellaro is showing us a now empty packet that contained her last nasal swab. We went through what we had left yesterday. Even though she's been strictly following CDC guidelines on who to test, she hasn't been able to order more, not from any medical supplier, including her regular supplier, Quest Diagnostics. And she can't even get hold of someone to find out why. We started out faxing, which is the typical thing that we do. Um, we made probably 15, 12, 15 calls yesterday. We get put on hold and eventually it disconnects. Meanwhile, all COVID-19 related supplies have been removed from the Quest Diagnostic website. A few weeks ago, Quest provided her with a list of alternative swabs that could be used, but she can't order those either, including the swab she uses to test for strep. What she's facing isn't unusual. Nationwide, any medical instrument used to test for COVID-19 is in scarce supply. New York's health department is allowing only people People who have been hospitalized to be tested for the virus. And a joint statement by three healthcare associations released last week urged that testing only be done on the elderly, on healthcare workers and first responders, and on people with underlying conditions whose treatment protocol would be affected if they had the virus. Meanwhile, the companies producing the foam tip swabs have kicked up production, but it's unclear how long it will take for supplies to reach Missouri. Of course, swabs are just one of this nurse practitioner's concern. This is her last face mask. I, and I'm just reusing the one that I have. Linda Wager reporting the only remaining testing sites are a couple of other urgent cares that have a handful of tests left. But once they're used up, they may or may not be able to get additional tests. Hospitals still have the test kits, but only for patients. All right, that's the latest from Kansas City. Back to you, Mike. Have a safe socially distancing weekend 
in Providence. You too, John. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo making a big announcement today saying that schools across the state will remain closed for at least an additional two weeks due to COVID-19. Let's go to WTEN's Karina Campabianca for more on the decision. Schools were originally supposed to be closed until April 1st, but with the number of coronavirus cases continuing to rise, they will now remain shut until at least April 15th. Public education is very important. It's important to all of us. On the other side of the balance beam is public health. Initially, the governor had directed schools to close by March 18th and remain closed until this coming Wednesday in an effort to flatten the curve. We also said that we would waive what's called the 180 day requirement that every school has to teach for 180 days. But reassessing the situation, the governor says there will be an extension on the closures. I don't do this uh, joyfully, but I think when you look at where we are and you look at the number of cases still increasing, it only makes sense to keep the schools closed. He says schools will need to continue to follow through with their plans to provide meals, distance learning and child care for essential workers. A spokesperson with the New York State School Boards Association says it was the right move. If he is, um, you know, based on his medical experts um, saying that schools should be closed uh, until the 15th, then, you know, we support that. And obviously we want to do what's uh, what's best for, for public health. It's what we expected, uh, but uh, districts were very anxious to get official word you know, this week because uh, you know, they need to advise uh, parents and teachers and bus drivers and all the other employees involved with having our schools operate. The governor also said today that the state has lost 10 to $15 billion in revenue due to the virus and will need to cut education aid. Reporting in Albany, Karina Capabianca. Karina, thank you. Think you need to be screened for the coronavirus? Well, there is an app for that. Today, Apple released an app and a website that will ask you about your symptoms and give you information on the virus. It's all thanks to a partnership with the CDC, FEMA, and the White House's Coronavirus Task Force. And Apple isn't stopping there. CEO Tim Cook said the company is donating 10 million face masks here at home and in Europe. Taylor Swift came to her fans aid in a big way this week. Several of her fans tweeted about their financial struggles because of everything going on with the coronavirus. So she decided to help them out by donating $3,000 to each of them. And she's not the only celebrity chipping in during all of this. Rihanna, Ryan Reynolds and Kristen Bell are also some of the stars who have donated, helping with everything from relief efforts to charities. And now a quick reminder of the symptoms of coronavirus. The primary symptoms are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. CDC says call your doctor before going to a clinic or hospital to be tested. And if you feel sick, please stay at home. And over the weekend, we'll be sitting down with doctors to get your key questions about the coronavirus answered. If you have a question, you can email it to coronaquestions at nextstar.tv. Your questions will be answered in Saturday and Sunday live streams. Those streams will start at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. The goal of our Next Star family is to make sure you continue to get the latest facts on the coronavirus without the fear. We'll be back at the same time on Monday night with stories from across the country. From now, I'm Mike Montecalvo from WPRI 12 in Providence. Thank you very much for joining us. Enjoy a good weekend and stay healthy.